Uh, hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for coming here. I hope this is the last session for you. So <laughs> I'm in between your Guinness journey and Hyperledger. So today we have an interesting topic about how we can accelerate uh, Hyperledger fabric specifically, and what is the use case we tried using in this case. So for every, for any blockchain, the business value is very important before going to whether we need to accelerate and what kind of model we need to choose and other things. In AMD, we tried to make this journey like five years before when Hyperledger.9 got released. But that time we don't have like any strong business use case so we couldn't proceed further. And again, we restarted this journey like a year before. So we'll walk through like what we have done. Quick disclaimer, and just a quick update about AMD. As you all know, like we are semiconductor company and we have presence in all the possible combinations of acceleration as well as on NIC as well as like standard CPUs and FPGs. And also our presence is there in all the way from edge to cloud and even beyond, like most of the satellites, mass rover, and all those areas. And also like AMD presence is there all the way from supercomputers to edge. So with all this presence, it also creates a unique challenge as a company for us. The challenge is mainly on this particular area. In the recent uh, COVID situation, you might have heard about a chip shortage, which created a huge uh, publicity for chip companies. So that is a constant news, at least for the past six months. And specifically for automotive, you might have heard, many of the countries, like people have to wait for somewhere between like two months to two quarters to get a new car. And this is the first time in US history, the used, market, uh, used car market price got increased. With all these things, since due to a shortage, we are also seeing a different kind of market happening in semiconductor. So that one we generally call as a gray market. So as you point out a few areas here, the huge uh, like a revenue loss also because of this gray market. One is like the current estimations around $75 billion loss because of various IP loss as well as like tampered chips and all those things. And it also have a huge impact to the job market itself. So how we can address this kind of things? So we always constantly look for how we can give a, like a proper workable chip to our customer. There is nothing got tampered and they're not buying it from wrong source. It's supposed to do what it's supposed to do. So as, as part of this, we validated and we worked on various solutions, specifically when it comes to supply chain in a blockchain use case we came out with like a three different options, how we can use a blockchain for this to address this need. So one is like a product provenance, as you all know, and we also looked into both tokenization as well as like a POS. POS is more like a point of sales. So what happened between like a distributor to the real client? Are they getting the real product, what we're shipping? At the end, we started focusing more towards the product provenance where we have like a lot of use cases to address and solve. So when it comes to product provenance, just I want to touch base. This is a very, very abstract, simplified diagram of a semiconductor supply chain market. So we have a dye bank where the fab creates the, our product. Then we have a packaging. Then we have a separate team for testing. And we also have like a finished goods. From there, there, it's getting shipped as well as like it goes to a customer. Sometimes we also have like a contract manufacturer. So it's a huge chain before we are getting that like real customers are getting the finished goods. So in all this whole model, what is happening here is uh, previously, the AMD is a central party where they receive the data, they will filter out something and they'll send it to the next process. Similarly, it is happening throughout and AMD is being a central point for all this data management. Now with uh, blockchain solution, what we are looking is how we can make like a mesh so that all the parties can exchange data freely. And again, based on a smart contract, they will get whatever the data what they want. During this process, one more interesting observation what we made is, since we are making it as a blockchain, the number of transactions are obviously going to increase compared to standard database, where I can have like a really huge table with multiple columns and people can keep on updating. But here, everything's based on transactions. So what does it mean is we need like high performance blockchain. So one is like a transaction volume is going to be keep increasing and all my following process, those also needs like a higher performance because they are looking like something like a database level, that kind of performance. 
where traditional blockchain generally lacks. And also we don't want to create like a very complex architecture with hundreds of nodes. We also make it full process simplify. So this is the time we are looking into various solutions, what is available in the market, which can address some of our future needs. So while doing research, what I notice is within AMD itself, one of our researchers done some kind of acceleration blockchain use case. So let me invite Harris to proceed with the next steps. Thank you. Hello. Okay. So um, I'm going to be a bit more technical than Muthu because he was explaining the business use case and why do we uh, wanted to go into the blockchain space and the supply chain and uh, product provenance. Uh, uh, I'm going to be a little bit more technical. So before I go into the details, just to give you a quick um, recap of how transactions flow through a Hyperledger fabric network. So most of you would already know this, that there is a client on the left-hand side, transactions get created and it is sent to endorsing peers. After the transactions have been endorsed, there are enough endorsements on a transaction. The client would send that uh, those transactions to the ordering service where the consensus protocol is run. And finally, what comes out of there is blocks of transactions. And those blocks are sent to all the peers in the system, which is highlighted as yellow here. We call them validator peers. I will come to that later. And these blocks are validated, transactions and validated, finally committed to the ledger. So what I want to highlight here is that um, in our um, observation and experience, the validator peers significantly limit the performance of a hyperledger fabric network. And the way these transactions flow through this life cycle, the third party, the external party, can only see the data after the blocks have been validated and committed to the ledger. And that's when the transaction is confirmed. So that is why we wanted to look into these validator peers and see what are the performance bottlenecks and how we can improve it and accelerate it for higher transaction volumes, near real-time updates. So here is a snapshot of a performance dashboard from uh, one of our um, uh, uh, validator peers in the network. Um, so what we are trying to show here is that we just took the standard vanilla fabric peer using CouchDB and the performance you get from such a peer is about only 150 transactions per second. That's far from what we wanted to kind of achieve at the end of the day. And we are not the only one to get this sort of performance. There are a lot of other papers which I've highlighted here. Um, and, uh, and those papers have also shown multiple times that validator peers become one of the major bottlenecks in a, a hyperledger fabric network. So let me switch gears and talk about FPGA cards. Um, so uh, an FPGA card is just like a GPU card. You can buy it off the shelf, and then you can plug it into the PCI slot of your server. Uh, but uh, unlike GPU cards, you can actually program these FPGA cards with custom hardware accelerator, which you can build for your particular application. And not only that, you can actually reprogram these uh, FPGA cards for different sorts of applications. So I can program it for a blockchain application, I can program it for a machine learning application, and so on. So inside um, an FPGA card typically uh, is uh, something called adaptive SOC chip. Uh, a simple example is shown on the left-hand side. Um, you can see, you might not be able to read all this, but there are a lot of blocks here. So some of these blocks are ARM processors. There are blocks which do PCIe uh, connectivity. There are blocks which do Ethernet connectivity. But the most important part is in the middle, the red block, which is called the adaptable hardware or programmable hardware. So this is where your programmable custom hardware can go. And then you can reprogram this for different uh, custom hardwares. So what we can actually do with an FPGA card is that we can actually program it to do compute, network, storage, acceleration all together in a single card. And then uh, we can also have it um, uh, connected to the CPU and we can have a hardware software co-design kind of a setup which is much, much accelerated for the application you want to implement. So with that in mind, coming back to Hyperledger Fabric and the validator peers becoming bottleneck, our solution to that problem is the accelerator we call blockchain machine. So essentially blockchain machine is an accelerated validator peer for Hyperledger Fabric, 
And you can see a picture there. So it's a server, a multi-core server, with an FPGA card or maybe multiple FPGA cards in the future. And uh, it's programmed for the accelerator we designed for Hyperledger Fabric Validator. Um, it is specifically designed for um, high performance. So what I mean by that is much higher transaction validation rates, uh, reduced block validation latency, and so on. Um, and then um, it is also designed to be adaptable. So what I mean by adaptability here is that uh, all of you would know that Hyperledger Fabric by design supports smart contracts, right? So you can install a new smart contract. So what if someone installs a new smart contract? We should be able to adapt or program, reprogram our hardware, upgrade it to include the new smart contract. And that's how we can have more smart contracts uh, supported over time. And then finally, um, uh, the blockchain machine peer is compatible with existing nodes in the network. So what, why that is important is because I can bring up a fabric network where all the nodes are standard nodes, for example, standard peer order nodes. And then one of the nodes is a blockchain machine peer. And that will work with all these existing nodes as well. And that's how you can first uh, evaluate it, see whether it gives the right performance you want. And then later you can upgrade over multiple cycles the rest of the nodes in the system as well. So the current status for our work is that it's available for Fabric uh, v1.4, although that I, I don't think anybody uses that anymore. Uh, and it's also available for v2.2, and it has already been open sourced as a Hyperledger Labs project called Fabric Machine. Uh, the software code is all open source, and the hardware is available on request. So if you want to try it out, please reach out to us. So let me give a little bit of more details of what blockchain machine is. So here's an overview. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a server, multi-core CPU here on the right-hand side, and an FPGA card plugged into the PCI slot, and there are a bunch of modules inside the FPGA card. So the FPGA card has a network interface. So what that means is that all the network traffic comes into the FPGA card and then goes through these modules. And what these modules are trying to do is that they implement certain types of network acceleration, for example, efficient transfer and access of uh, block and transaction data from the Ethernet packets. Uh, um, there's a compute accelerator, which accelerates the verification and validation of the transactions. And um, overall, what happens is that data comes in, gets processed, and then it's ready for the CPU to be accessed and further processed on the CPU side. So we call this bump in the wire processing. It's a very typical term, and it's a very uh, popular um, uh, paradigm for higher performance computing. So data streams in through the FPGA card goes all the way to the CPU. So a little bit more details, protocol processor. At a very high level, we have a very hardware-friendly protocol to send blocks from order to the validator peer, and then it will extract all the relevant data that is needed for validation of the block and the transactions, for example, transaction IDs, block IDs, uh, read-write set. People who work with Fabric would know this uh, uh, and how you uh, do the endorsement policies and so on. And then the block processor is basically the compute accelerator. We have um, different types of block and transaction level pipelines here. So what we are trying to achieve is that we want to process as many transactions in parallel and in a pipeline fashion so that we can achieve high throughput. And internally, it has a lot of different types of transaction processing engines, validation engines, and so on. And finally, we have something called a memory map or a register map. So the idea here is that once the data has been processed, transactions has been validated, um, the results are basically written into some sort of a register map, which can be accessed by the CPU. So we provide a Go language API, which is then used by the Fabric software code to basically interact with the hardware, get the data out of the hardware, and then combine it with the block on the software side. And this also provides us a way to basically overlap communication, uh, overlap computation that is happening on the CPU side uh, versus the FPGA. So we can have certain operations running on CPU while other operations running on FPGA in parallel as well. So we can overlap these uh, computations. So here is a final snapshot of how the whole system looks like in terms of implementation and in terms of how the hardware and software is partitioned. On the left-hand side, uh, we have the entire system where um, you can see the CMAX subsystem. 
uh, without going into details, essentially a CMXF system allows you connectivity to the Ethernet port or the network port on the FPGA, so Ethernet packets come in through here. Then on the right-hand side, we have a QDMA subsystem, basically that provides you connectivity and access to the CPU, so CPU can interact with the accelerator. And then in the middle, the user logic box uh, is where the accelerator goes, so you can see we have the protocol block processor and the maps and everything in there. On the right-hand side here, we show how the hardware software basically uh, runs different operations of the validator peer. So in a, in a typical standard vanilla fabric validator peer, all of these happen on the CPU side. But then for us, we basically offload most of the uh, computationally intensive operations. Uh, for example, verification of the block, verification or validation of the transactions, the VSCC, the database, MVCC, and so on, all on the hardware. And then the CPU is only reading that data, the final data from the FPGA, the hardware accelerator, combining it with the block, writing it to the ledger. So what comes out here, the ledger from this blockchain machine peer is basically exactly the same as any other peer in the system. So now the main question, the billion dollar question, what we were able to achieve with all this. So here is a quick snapshot. We have a lot more results. So if you're interested, we have a research paper in ICDCS, the Distributed Computing Systems Conference. Uh, you can take a look at that. But what I'm trying to highlight here is that on the left-hand side is a standard um, fabric validator peer uh, with uh, multiple CPUs. It can achieve up to about 6,000 transactions per second. And on the right-hand side with this blocks in machine, we were able to see up to 70,000 transactions per second as well in validation throughput. Um, so the way we benchmark, this is using Hyperjack Caliper, standard benchmarking tool. We use the small bank benchmark, which is a typical banking application that creates accounts, transfer monies, and so on. And then all these peers are using level DB. So now I'll stop here and then hand it back to Mutu, who will talk about how we took this research project and then applied it and integrated it into a production level network. Uh, thank you, Harris. So Harris was able to convince us like, yes, we can get like higher throughput, but as a typical IT, like uh, we are not convinced yet whether it's going to work or we need to do some different like, type of programming, whether it's compatible, all those questions as any other customers, it exists for us also. So what we done next is, uh, as part of the process, we want to implement this particular supply chain solution. Initially, we haven't used any of this custom hardware. We just use like ASICs, like a phase one, typical like standard software, written everything for CPU, and we are able to make our actual application work first. Then as a phase two, what we've done is we introduced this particular blockchain machine to one of the only one org to see how it works. It was able to work like transparently, specifically like Harris and Steve, who, who's from, who's our uh, blockchain SME, they work together and we are able to do everything like transparently without doing any code change from developer or developing point of view. So currently we are in phase three, so we are working on how we can uh, introduce this blockchain machine to multi blocks. So the overall idea is more like a simplified diagram. So what our uh, current thought process is, we'll have a standard um, uh, hyper uh, hyperledger network where AMD already has a blockchain machine and we're going to introduce to a couple of customers at a later stage and slowly introduce to various vendors and partners whom we are working. So what we've done on AMD side is it's not just uh, implementing for sake of blockchain. So here we also introduce like the full application scope as it is. For example, this particular application integrated all the way from our ERP to our client application. So we also took like a modular approach. For example, like we, we had like a message queues where all the data is getting received from our standard systems and we also created like a client worker, this more like a parallel workers as a transaction processor. And we also created various REST engines so that it is like a standard inter IT interface plus all the chain code and other things are running in our accelerator hardware. And we also create like additional half chain databases and we do create a, like separate client applications also. Specifically in this case, it's a mobile application which is using like backend uh, uh, Hyperledger fabric. Now I can show a quick demo which is like a recorder. Semiconductor supply chain is a space where significant value can be extracted from enterprise blockchain solutions. 
AMD supply chain is an interconnection of organizations, activities, and resources for transforming raw materials into a finished product for delivery to the end customer. Managing the integrity of products and processes in a multi-stakeholder supply chain environment is a significant challenge. With rising expectations from our customers on end-to-end -end visibility, establishing reliable provenance, preventing fraud, and counterfeiting is crucial for AMD. Now that compute-intensive tasks are addressed by the blockchain machine, AMD is able to create a supply chain pilot to showcase a real-world implementation using accelerated Hyperledger fabric. Okay, so this demo is like a quick demo like how we developed the UI, which is like uh, mobile-ready and also like the entire process in which in various steps, like various transactions are created with proper transaction code and people can go back and verify inside a blockchain what is happening under particular transactions. So this, this, this is the application which we created for some of our external customers. And moving up, so we'll also show what exactly happens on the performance aspect. In this video, we show a live demo of our Hyperledger Fabric Network with Hardware Accelerated Validator Peer. We set up a typical Prometheus and Grafana-based dashboard to look at a few performance metrics of validator peers. For this demo, we only show the most relevant metrics. First, I would like to go through the configuration we used, which is shown here in the top row. As you can see, we use Fabric v2.2, and we also report the total number of blocks that have been committed to the ledger. So far, the ledger has more than 60,000 transactions. The first set of metrics, which I would like to focus on, is related to the validation of block and its transactions. We define this as the time it takes to validate all the transactions of a block and commit them to the state database. The top row shows the throughput for a vanilla peer running on a multi-core server, while the second row shows the same for an FPGA accelerated peer. We configured a block size of 50, but it can be smaller sometimes depending on the incoming transaction rate, as shown here. The software peer is only able to achieve a few hundred transactions per second, which we realize is because of the slower database accesses. We use CouchDB as the state database because our application needs to run various queries on the committed data afterwards. The hardware peer, on the other hand, is able to process thousands of transactions per second because all of the bottleneck operations in validation phase are being executed on the FPGA card. This results in a huge speed up, which is shown here on the right hand side. You can also see the throughput over time of both the hardware and software peers plotted in real time as the transactions are received and validated by the peers. The second set of metrics is related to committing of the block to disk based ledger. The reason we separate out this operation is that it always runs on the CPU. Here, what I would like to highlight is that the ledger throughput of both the hardware and the software peer is about the same because the ledger is written by the CPU. The third set of metrics is the commit throughput of the peer, which is a combination of the validation and ledger throughputs of the peer shown earlier. Here you can see that the commit throughput of the software peer is very close to its validation throughput because it is dominated by the database accesses. The hardware peer, on the other hand, delivers at least 10 times more throughput and sometimes much more because of the hardware acceleration. This is shown as the speed up here on the right hand side. However, a very interesting point to note here is that this throughput is quite a bit lower than the validation throughput of the hardware peer reported at the top. From further analysis, we found out that even after uploading bottleneck operations to hardware, the fabric software running on the CPU is still much slower. We realized that we need to better optimize the software in tandem with the hardware. 
For example, we can use a better disk to improve ledger throughput and better overlap operations in hardware and software. We are currently working on these optimizations. Thank you. Uh, so overall, we are able to achieve like better uh, performance like this, what we could see during the peak, like the pure validation aspect point of view, we are able to get up to 20x, 120x. And whereas like uh, the entire operations, we are able to get somewhere between 10 to 20x overall. So all this are happening using this particular Alveo C1100 FPGA card. So this is like commercially available card like. So when it comes to implementation of this whole solution, so we follow like a standard IT approach, like all the deployment is happening through CICD because we have to try out like multiple times, like we are like the entire test op automation pipeline created and all the integration happens through like a standard REST interface so that as a customer or various application no need to rewrite. And also like from architecture point of view, we decoupled all the aspect in that way, there's no tightly coupled and there's no dependency of either hardware or blockchain version or the ERP version, all those aspect. And also monitoring is kind of key. We also created some additional monitoring aspect as you've seen previously in Prometheus and other aspect as well. So entirely we created like end to end deployment methodology so that it can be ready for production deployment. Some of the insights, I cannot call it as a challenges, the first uh, insight is more about how to do an order adoption. For example, like always, there is some kind of dilemma whether I need to put like a new hardware and other things. But nowadays in the enterprise data center also it became like more and more um, commercial or visible. For example, for many of the training, we use a GPU. Similarly, like acceleration also coming into mainstream in many of the enterprise data center itself. And as usual, get your management support so that the whole process can happen smooth. And compliance and legal is very important and because here we're talking about a smart contract and other things which are more close to legal rather than like IT code. So we be involved with compliance and legal while we are thinking about a blockchain itself and address all the concerns and questions, why blockchain, what it cannot do and what it can do, all this aspect. And security also a very tricky portion like as usual like InfoSec has tons of questions about the security of the whole solution as it is. So that also we are able to address and UI that, that is one piece we are we haven't considered the initial stage. Then later we found out for blockchain, we may need like a different type of UI so that we can show the full strength of the blockchain. So this are the total overall like key takeaways. So what we noticed is we are able to do like a better traceability with the whole model of this blockchain so that all the data is coming straight away to this particular blockchain aspect. And also we are able to prove like there can be the gray market tracking can be happen better. And overall we are able to reduce the overall administration and paperwork because of this otherwise we need to go and scrap some other website to find out whether that is valid and all those things. And overall we are able to find out like better transaction throughput which can be usable once we are going into mainstream with multiple partners and customers. So. With this particular solution, we are very confident we should be able to get minimum 10x and much, much more beyond using this order acceleration. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, yes, please. Yeah, hi, thanks for this very insightful presentation. I have a basically two, maybe three questions. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So yeah, sure. Um, the first one is, um, if you're using the FPGA, how did you get the code into the FPGA? Did you use uh, some kind of high level description language and then port it over via VHDL or what's the tool chain that you used for that? And um, if you're using FPGA and want to scale it, um, isn't there some point in time where you want to move all this into an ASIC because it's much cheaper uh, if you want to have a lot of them? And last not least, um, well, this is maybe, I don't know if you can comment on that, but you mentioned that um, we have um, a shortage in the semiconductor supply chain currently, but I heard uh, that this is current, currently reversed because we have uh, in some areas at least a surplus of, uh, of, uh, of uh, chips. So how is that going to uh, balance out in the near term, hopefully? Thanks. Maybe I can address the last question, like other two questions Harris can address. Yes. Okay, uh, especially when it comes to shortage, yes, the trends are currently reversing, 
But what we notice is whenever there's a shortage of semiconductor, the gray market became like more and more visible and many of our customers, are, it's, it's industry-wide, like they end up buying somewhere in eBay, they're not sure like is it a real product they're buying and all this aspect. So that's where we want to have like a product provenance aspect. The other two questions like, yes, sir, is on yes, technical so aspect. So for the first one, um, the implementation is a combination of a few different uh, setups. So we have used HLS, we have also used VHDL, we have also used something else called uh, P4 language, which is specifically for network processing. So for example, our protocol processor that's implemented in P4 is a high level language, and then you can compile it into VHDL. Some of the parts are in HLS, but then the main core of the block processor, like the uh, validation of transactions uh, and things like that, those are in VHDL for the best performance you can get out of it. So whatever we found uh, uh, made more sense, we use that for the implementation. So it's not like you have to use a certain thing, you can implement it in any way if you want, as long as you get the performance out of it. Um, for the second, oh, what was the second question? <laughs> Oh, yes. So, yeah, I agree with you. I think at some point we would have to move uh, these into, let's say, hardened blocks, either inside the adaptive SOC or have a separate ASIC for it once it becomes a more mainstream kind of thing. At this point, it's more of uh, um, still we are exploring. We have something which we are trying to move into production. But yes, I would agree once it matures, it should go and become ASICs or some hardened blocks inside FPGA chips. Uh, so the question is, when it's going to be available in the cloud? Uh, cloud, there are a little bit challenges now. Still, we are in a pilot stage. So once it, the adoption is coming like much more or mainstream, definitely there's a possibility of cloud. But there's one challenge because we are using network port of the FPG, which is not generally exposed in many of the public clouds. But there are in a few specific use cases, they were ready to open it up. So once the adoption became like mainstream, definitely we can look into it. Right now, it's currently available in some of the colo clouds, not a standard public clouds, to try it out. Yeah, so basically, um, the implementation is not specific to an FPGA card in your on-premises server. Like Amazon F1 instances have FPGA cards that should work there, but because the FPGAs are receiving data directly from the network, so the FPGA network ports should have network access, which is typically not provided by cloud providers. Once that becomes available, of course, this should be available to try out there too. So one more question from here. So um, first of all, do you really need to, to support 14,000 transactions per second in your um, system? Um, and uh, also how many um, third party systems or internal systems you had to integrate to, um, to make this um, a viable solution? Only for this particular small client app, we end up integrating with around seven to eight different systems for data feed. The, the transaction per second, the many of the data is coming as a bus to us. So that's why the transaction rate keep increasing. It's not like a sustained like 20,000 transaction throughout the day. So we don't want to cube it like as much as possible. We want to uh, complete it faster, but still it's currently focused on very, very small set of product, not for the wider AMD product range. Yeah, just to add for that 14,000 transactions, as you said, if you have a burst of transactions coming into the system, uh, if you know about queuing theory, the, the delay and the latency for transactions will increase exponentially. So what we want is because we want almost near real-time updates. So under the peak workload, we want to be able to support as much transactions per second as we can, just like, you know, a visa uh, system where, you know, uh, during shopping sessions, like uh, shopping season, they typically uh, say that they have to do 65, 70,000 transactions per second. But in normal workloads, maybe they're only doing 10,000, 15,000. But if, you don't, if the system is not able to support 65 or 70,000 during the shopping season, there will be huge delays, like minutes, hours for transactions to settle down. So the same thing applies here as well. 
<laughs> and that's why we have FPGA card to accelerate, right? <laughs> Uh, so this is maybe a technical question, but I was wondering where you got most of the speed up from uh, CPU to FPGA. Was it the data access or the actual computations themselves? Um, so, um, yeah, if you're more interested, you can look at our paper. But the summary is, um, if I remember correctly, about 10 to 20 percent of the time is spent on accessing the data because all the data in Hyperledger Fabric is, uh, it uses uh, protocol buffers. It's a layered structure. So if you do profiling, you will see about 10, 20, 10 to 20% of the time is spent there, accessing the transaction, the data, the endorsement, uh, 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 poli so not policy, the endorsements, and so on. Uh, the, rest of the, day, uh, the rest of the time is actually spent about 50% in the actual uh, ECDSA verification. So the digital signatures, which uses ECDSA scheme, uh, that takes about uh, 50 to 60, and in some cases up to 70% of the time with the SHA-256 hashing as well. And then the rest, 10, 20, 25% is spent in level DB accesses. So we are getting most of the speed up. Uh, by using multiple of these ECDSA engines in the FPGA. So we have, we have like parallel and pipelined transaction processing, which efficiently uses these engines to do the verifications as fast as possible. And then because we have in-hardware database, which is of course going to be faster than what you will get as go-level DB. So that's where the rest of the speedo comes from. I think one last question on from my side. The Hedera consensus, uh, you can replace with the existing, the the orders with Hedera consensus protocol. That's what I heard. Have you tried that? If you do that, then your problem goes away. I'm not aware of the Hedera consensus protocol and it can replace Raft. But what, what do you mean by the problem going away? <laughs> can you elaborate? I, I thought that orders will go away once you replace Raft with uh, Hedera. Then you get this 100,000 transactions per second in Hyperledger itself. I, I, I'm, I'm not very sure. I'm not a techie, but the way I understood, I explained it. Okay. Uh, I'll look into it later and get back to you. <laughs> I'm not sure about the outright performance, but it is another Hyperledger Labs project, so... You should be able to take a quick look at it. On the on the cloud side, though, there are a couple of, uh, like I'm thinking of Equinix Metal, which used to be Packet. I mean, it'd be interesting to sort of talk to folks like that, um, possibly Ridge Cloud. So in other words, once you get beyond the hyperscale clouds, there are some bare metal cloud providers that could be interested in this. Yeah, yeah, we are already working with a few bare metal providers to see how we can host. So right now we are planning to host some of the demo environments so that people can come and try it out. So we are working with few vendors in this aspect. Any other questions? Okay. okay. If not, uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for attending the session. We'll all meet you in Guinness. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.